Well, thank you very much, John, Gisbert, and Michaela. That was that was great. So we now have a, a short panel discussion. For those joining us, you know, if you have any questions to any of the three speakers, please type them in, in the Q&A uh, box. If you could indicate who the question is for, that would be useful too. And then uh, after this panel discussion, we'll go through uh, some of those. So uh, John Gisbert and Michaela, I, I suspect many of the people who've joined us today are actually experimentalists. You know, they might work in a lab studying proteins or cells. They might uh, design drugs, or perhaps some of them are even involved in, in clinical decisions like Michaela spoke about. So um, I guess many of them are wondering, you know, where does this now all go? You know, will artificial intelligence replace our experiments? Or even worse, will they uh, replace us? So I thought we could we could start by um, by that question. Perhaps we will go from John to Gisbert and Michaela. Get your first opinions on that question. I I don't see it. Okay, you know I I work at a company whose goal is to develop artificial general intelligence, but we're not there yet, right? A system that's really, you know, thinking and planning and making decisions that with uh, human level intelligence, but we're not, we're not there at that moment. So we'll, we'll set aside replacing them. I think there is an interesting question of replacing experiment. And I think there's definitely, definitely no way it replaces all experiment as with any, uh, any computational tool you hope it, I, the way I define myself as a, as like a computational biologist is what does success look like? Success look, is when experimentalists look at the outputs and do a better experiment because of it. And I think really, I think there is some, there will be some times when you can look at an alpha fold structure and skip experimental structure determination or have more confidence in the relationship of say, crystallographic conditions to cellular conditions. But I think quite a lot of it is all enabling us to kind of go after this business of understanding the cell. And I, and I really see it as, experimentalists being the expert in what they do next. And I always look at like the alpha fold work is you can have this answer in an hour or so, or if it's in the database in 10 seconds, and then you can use that to plan your experiment. You can use that to do functional studies instead. Um, you can th feed it into larger systems, but I think we'll do all these things. And I'm most concerned that we do them um, in proportion to say the, the reliability of the machine and in understanding really what's predicted, what's not. And then, and then experimentalists are really all the time behave on, you know, work with uncertainty, work with, you know, not being sure what the experiments mean and everything else. And I think it's the normal case of things and it's the exciting part of science. Elizabeth, what do you think from the chemist's point of view? Well said, John, hard to follow here. <laughs> Um, I'd say uh, AI tools today already um, can help us reduce um, experimental work to those experiment and provide us with time to focus on those experiments that are challenging, that are fun, that demand human thinking. So the, 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 the natural intelligence, uh, for example, uh, when, when, when talking about automating drug discovery, automating the laboratory, um, my point of view is that we should automate whatever we can automate uh, and in order to to make use, to, to, to best use a, a human's capability, because our capability is our brain is not made uh, to um, sift through millions of chemical structures. After, well, 10, 20, 30 at most, we have forgotten the first two we had, we had a look at. Um, so here I see um, the, the future of also in, in chem chemical education that uh, we will have uh, we, we need to adapt our curricula, uh, our syllabus to, um, to include AI and machine learning. Uh, so that, and this was also a question in, in the chat, um, so that the future generation of, of chemists is equipped with this knowledge and can think of the AI as a colleague in the lab. Cool. Thank you. That that kind of resonates with Michaela, one of Michaela's last slides, which has this open session for everyone interested. I think 
That was really cool. Michaela, would you like to add? Yes. So uh, while my two colleagues here are focusing, of course, on empowering and possibly replacing chemists, in my case, there is absolutely no question that we are not going to replace the clinicians. That's not a focus at all. The focus in our case is to really empower the clinicians to make judgments and be able to help the patients in front of them. As a matter of fact, as we are discovering more and more drugs and better and better drugs, and that's wonderful, we are also going to have a much more complex task of deciding which drugs, what to give, when to give, when not to give a drug, when to stop a drug and change to another drug, as different types of morbidities and comorbidities are evolving. So that is a tremendously complex task. And it is one where we need tools not to replace the clinicians, which we will never be able to do, but to provide them with information and knowledge as to what seems to work best for the type of patient in front of them and provide them with information and certainty estimates associated with them, but also present them with uh, different types of um, information about side effects, competing risks associated with these treatments, because it is not only about the effect of a drug, but also the effect of this drug on other morbidities and comorbidities. And all of this needs to be studied and it cannot be studied on the basis of a clinical trial. It needs to be studied on the basis of a post-marketing analysis of these numerous drugs. And for that machine learning can help empower the clinician, but in the end is the clinician and the patient together that need to make the decision. And finally, there is the human touch that the clinician always has, which really, um, will never, I'd never believe this will be uh, taken over by a machine because it is really um, almost like a supernatural sense of understanding the patient and understanding symptoms of the patient, which I never think that any general machine intelligence will ever, it's about the EQ, which is very much playing a role in how the patient will look like. And, and as I conveyed, I really don't believe that it is machine learning alone. Even then, it is machine learning together with biological knowledge and chemical knowledge, which together can help put this puzzle together. Yes. Thank you, Michaela. It sounds like empowering is, is the commonality between the three answers, right? It, nobody you know, it's not that AI will replace the humans, they will, uh, they will empower them. So John briefly touched on, you know, how confident does the AI itself think in, in its, that its prediction is, right? Because as, as experimentalists, if we're going to be empowered by these methods, then we need to kind of know how much can we trust them, right? So John touched upon that. So I was wondering whether Michaela and, and, and Gisbert perhaps have some some ideas in that too. Of course, drugs will always be tried in in tests and clinical trials. But you know, how how much can we trust what the what the um, AI tells us? I uh, completely agree with John uh, on this point. I think uncertainty estimation and really frequentist guarantees are extremely important for everything I do. I do a lot of work on building not only analytical models, but also uncertainty estimation associated with these models, because we need to know and tell the clinician and the patient when we know and when we do not know. So I think that one of the most important parts and components of machine learning for healthcare in, in my setting, where the focus is empowering clinicians, is to provide these models, not only with interpretability, but maybe even more important, with confidence guarantees associated with it, such that the clinicians know when these models are not confident in the predictions they are making for the class of patients in front of them. So I think that's vital, but complicated. <laughs> Jesper, would you have 100% some... agreed. Um, I'm not sure to which degree we will ever be able to 
interpret or understand these machine learning models, the complex machine learning models, you spoke about latent spaces and, and such, um, in, in terms of the language we've, we're using and we've learned uh, to express uh, natural phenomena, language of chemistry, language of medicine, language of biology. So here I see li clear limitations of uh, the understandability uh, or interpretability of machine learning models. Um, the, the aspect of confidence, um, uh, this is absolutely mandatory to, uh, I think there shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be any uh, machine learning model without um, uh, uh, indications to, towards the uh, domain of applicability. So these can be con confidence uh, estimations. These can be obtained by, uh, by experiments. So we typically uh, synthesize and test these molecules uh, suggested by the computer. And once we have done this 50, 60 times, then we have an approximate idea uh, to which degree it works and uh, to which degree it doesn't. And this also uh, goes back to the previous questions. Here we need uh, real experimentalists to do the legwork. Cool, John. I think uh, two, two points to make to this that I think are kind of interesting. One is I think it, when we talk about interpretability, and really talking about, in a sense, second guessing, like I don't believe that's a good explanation is often what we're looking for out of interoperability. And it can be useful, but I think it is not as important as model as we should own our own confidence in this as developers of machine learning tools that when we say we're right, we should be right. I think there is also people overestimate the interoperability of experimental biology. No one, uh, no one will will say I don't want that crystal structure because you can't explain to me why you needed those crystallization conditions, because it's been well characterized as a procedure that when you follow this is its reliability and this is the places where it's unreliable. For example, around crystal contacts, and I think there's this social aspect of the community and the post market analysis of computational tools, in terms of you know all the papers on when can we trust them under what conditions. And one of the things I'll say is that this is a place where the community, I think CASP really sets the gold standard in, in uh, clinical trials for uh, computational tools. And the community could, I think, even do more to do very, very careful measurements because you don't want to be in the condition of I tried it once and it didn't work, therefore it doesn't work for this class. You really want to think about how do we build in these things that help us understand in more and more areas, when are they reliable, in what ways are they reliable? And I think as we get more computational tools uh, that start to really impact the experiments people do, this is going to become incredibly important how we think about understanding their performance. Cool. Michaela? Sorry to jump in again. Um, John put me to sing. And I want to make two points here. One of them is, of course, the type of uh, methods I'm talking about are quite different than what John and Gisbert have talked about. And one of the challenge for, for us is extremely challenging because we do not want only uncertainty estimation for predictions, for which we know a lot. And my lab and many others have done work in that area. What's even trickier for us is we need for counterfactuals uncertainty estimation as well. And dealing with all the biases that we have and the fact that we not always observe these counterfactuals makes the problem of confidence estimation even trickier, but it doesn't mean that we and others have not made progress in that area. I'm just saying that this is challenging methodologically as well. And finally, uh, while I completely agree with what John and Gisbert said, for the chemical structure, I think that it's more important to be right than to be interpretable. In our case, because we are very much building these tools, not for chemists, not for the pharma pharmacists, but rather for the clinicians and patients. These tools need to be understandable and it need to be debuggable and, and um, very carefully considering the people using them. This is useful for them to integrate them in their ecosystem. So I think for us, interpretability is key and even more so than if you just discover drugs because we really need to inform the decision makers and they need to understand the basis on which these particular predictions and decisions are made. Very good. Jesper, do you want to com comment on that? Um, what did I want to say? <laughs> Sorry. 
You did put your hand up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off, uh, I'm just off, uh, off track right now. Sorry for that. It's too late here. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Uh, perhaps you know we can we can start moving this to the uh, Q and A session. And I, I was struck by one question actually already by uh, Manasa Desai, and I think it would be valuable to hear an answer from all three of you. She asked, you know, if if I'm a beginner, just finished the master, how do you go about learning all this? You know, it is what what would be a good way? What would you recommend people interested in machine learning? And and you know, they all come from their each respective fields, but what what could they do to get into this? Who would like to go first on that? I'm talkative. Um, I I think there's 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 two paths here, and I think there's two ways to get into this. Um, I think one is from, let's say, the, the computationalist machine learning methods developer side and one from the user biologist side. Now, I'll start kind of maybe from the user side. The most important thing is to use it widely. You don't want the very first time you use a computational tool to be on anger on a problem where you really need to be right. You want, the, you want to try it on many problems where you know the answer, some that you think are as hard maybe as the problem you're studying. Like, Think of these in some ways as black boxes, a productive way, or as a new experimental tool where you characterize its behavior by trying it. And I think as users, like really understanding these tools, understanding them on known problems is certainly how we work with them. And I think how users can build their intuition. I think this is one of the really important roles of something like the AlphaFold database is that everyone got to see it on lots of structures where they knew the answer, they had an understanding of the system. And so that helped the community build a collective intuition about when and how this was reliable or not. I think from the kind of computationalist side, read papers. I mean, that's kind of how I got into it is I, I kind of saw there was this cool area coming up. And so I read everything I could get my hands on. And I think we we kind of underestimate how much just digging in and and going about this will let you develop ideas and then you can try them and play with them and develop intuition. And it's like, it's like how you learn like math or physics in good classes. You, you learn it by doing the homework. The lecture isn't where you learn it, right? Don't listen to us. Go try and fit models and you'll figure out quickly how these kind of things work and, and play and do. And that's, the, that's my advice. Cool. Let Thanks, me John. jump in as the academic then, Shores. I would say if you are interested to learn more about that, come to Cambridge, uh -huh. where we have this wonderful Cambridge Center for AI and Medicine, where we have clinicians, we have biologists, we have machine learners like me working together, trying to really teach uh, the young generation before they go and work for DeepMind or for other companies, um, they, they come and learn in this multidisciplinary ecosystem. So I would say, find a place where you have the ability to learn from many disciplines and having this interdisciplinary approach. As a matter of fact, as we speak in Cambridge, this center that I'm directing, the Cambridge Center for Rhine Medicine, is running a summer school that is aimed at both industry as well as students aiming at learning more about this topic. So I think that there is a tremendous opportunity nowadays, unlike in my time, to be in this interdisciplinary academic environment to learn from these different fields. And I think that that's the future, rather than be a monolithic person learning just biology, medicine, or machine learning. Cool. Yes, Hundred percent agreed. Um, I second every statement made. I mean, there are uh, already a number of of these chemoinformatics or AI summer school e or winter school events. Uh, participate in those. Uh, um, workshops and and uh, do the online tutorials. They're, they're, they are popping up everywhere right now. At ETH as well, like in uh, Cambridge, we have uh, an AI center that is interdisciplinary, even transdisciplinary. And um, maybe one final statement uh, along these lines. I would I would suggest uh, you you go where your desire, where your curiosity, where your heart takes you, rather than forcing yourself. Uh, with the impression I must learn this or that, but I don't want to. No, as as John said, uh, be be playful, <laughs> play 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 with with tools. But you you certainly need uh, 
to be able um, to to uh, to understand and 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 write in in a scripting language uh, as a natural scientist, for example, Python would be a good entry point here. Thanks, Gisbert. You want to comment on that, John? Or? Or it kind of made me think about one other thing, which is maybe my one my one controversial opinion is don't just go to the interdisciplinary places. I think you will get if you want to learn machine learning for biology, you're 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 better off sequentially going to the best biology place you can in the world, and then the best machine learning place that you can find in the world, right? Go to the go learn the machine learners worldview from the very best machine learners. Go learn the biologist worldview from the very best biologists and build the synthesis and understand how people have built the synthesis. But so I think one of the challenges of interdisciplinary work is you really have to integrate both worldviews 100%. And so my slightly controversial opinion is make sure you're not only working at the intersection, otherwise you can build the wrong system to solve a non-problem, for example, or not understand like the worldview and technologies of machine learning and how to bring them in a novel way to these systems. That's my controversial I opinion. I need to disagree with John about that. <laughs> so definitely I will agree with him that you need to be in the best possible place. But let's be honest, a variety, so definitely the best places often have both the best in machine learning as well as the best in biology or best medicine. But the reality is that, for instance, in my area, machine learning for healthcare, there are many machine learners that have a tool. They have understood a tool and they beat everything with that particular one tool without the imagination and the need to model correctly complex world of, for instance, medicine. I do not know much about chemistry, but John, if you allow me, in the area of medicine, it is very complicated to come up with complex models. And yet, for instance, what we have been showing in our lab over the years is that we are able to have a substantial number of papers in the best machine learning conferences where pure machine learning is, um, let's say, the pure machine learners are competing for, and yet be mindful of the complex world of medicine. And that cannot be learned easily in a lab just learns and teaches machine learning for, I don't know, uh, having cats and dogs, but one needs to understand the complex world of medicine. I guess we need to get dinner and, and discuss this over. Uh, yes, I can, I can add from my own experiment because we've been dabbling with, with, dabbling with machine learning too, that it is, it is different languages that the different fields often speak. And it is being able to speak to each other with experts from the different fields and building bridges between them. That, that is often the, the problem there. Okay, given the amount of time, I thought I'd briefly select one or two questions for each of you specifically about your talk and then uh, see how that goes. So uh, Gisbert, uh, Chiara Rapisarda asks whether your, your molecules to do this, the, the prediction of, of uh, functionality, do they do this de novo just from the drug or do they need the knowledge of the binding site of the drug in order to make these predictions? In fact, uh, in fact, uh, today I only presented ligand-based design approaches. So we, we play ignorant uh, regarding the, the, the protein side, the receptor binding side. Everything I presented was done without any knowledge of the uh, cognate protein. But of course, um, the, the, the other part of the design world, drug design world, namely the structure-based design world, and uh, this cer certainly uh, uh, place to 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 alpha fold for, for example um, uh, is a very active field of research we and others have developed such technology uh, but there to the best of my knowledge there is maybe one paper out or coming out uh, that that does this uh, in a in a generative way from binding pocket to ligand uh, we are currently synthesizing and testing such compounds and once done uh, we'll publish exciting thank you uh, John, um, Krishna was wondering about uh, uh, plant, pr plant proteins. So they mentioned that plant proteins are somewhat underrepresented in the PDB. So they were wondering, you know, does, does alpha fold do well on, on plant proteins or, or is that a problem? To my knowledge, yes. I think the, the general evidence has been confidence is high. Confidence is still reliable among plant proteins in general. I mean, always look at the confidence. I will say sequencing could sequencing coverage may differ. One of the things to say is that alpha fold really 
doesn't so you would you would need like weird evolutionary patterns might throw off i can see that in viruses maybe but i wouldn't expect it in plant protein so but i'll i'll say i'll say also there are plant protein structures there are ones after our training cutoff so the very best way to answer that is to look at the plant proteins that are available and the good thing about evaluating machine learning is you can do it on 20 examples you don't need a thousand mm -hmm. and there are probably certainly 20 examples in the last couple of years that you could use cool um, Michaela then Jack uh, asks about the role of the knowledge from longitudinal studies. You know, it, is that type of knowledge being part of the uh, machine learning approach? Very much so. So thank you for this question. So um, as one of my clinical collaborators is saying, medicine is a the 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 art of medicine is about understanding the time series, the longitudinal pathway of the patient how the patient got to a particular stage of disease, what types of morbidities and comorbidities have developed, how do they respond to drugs. So lo looking longitudinally at the trajectory of disease with and without intervention, such as treatments, definitely is part of what we are doing. And this is, again, I'm going to advertise this September 19th at 4 p.m. engagement session where we are talking exactly about longitudinal trajectories of disease. Cool. And join us. Yeah, thanks. Uh, perhaps another one uh, for Gisbert, this one from Lou Sheffer. Uh, uh, and they ask, has there been a systematic effort to identify all targets of known approved drugs? Because that might help in finding useful side effects of already approved drugs. Very good point. Very good question. Love it. Um, this has been done uh, using our tools and other tools that are around. Uh, uh, I think almost every pharma company has done this and many academic groups as well. And repurposing uh, of, um, of, of known drugs for other indications, for other treatments, and systematically predicting potential side effects, undesired effects uh, of drugs. This has been done very successfully uh, using these uh, prediction tools. Cool. Thank you. Uh, John, then I have one more for, um, for you. Uh, Zhao Ming Zhu asks, what's your perspective on RNA structure prediction? I guess you get that one quite often. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a very interesting problem. So we've seen some recent work on it by at least two labs. I know Jeng Lab has put out one with a uh, with a uh, uses a lot of the ideas from AlphaFold. There's another one, and I apologize, I can't remember it. Uh, I think what is almost certainly true is that the kind of ideas in AlphaFold will improve RNA structure prediction. The absolute level that we'll get to with those and other ideas, I think is still an open question that a lot of labs are working on. I know also some RNA structures were present in this round of CASP where we'll get results in December. So I, I expect, what I think is very certain is that we will get some rapid progress on it. And I think the absolute level that we will top out at, and obviously the, there's very few RNA structures, only a couple thousand in PDB and something like half are ribosomal proteins. So I think the, uh, the question of what will be the absolute level will just have to be answered empirically and carefully and where, where these systems will be reliable. But I have no doubt we'll see some progress and probably much more progress in the future as people like Shores help drive cryo-EM for RNA structure. And I'm sure we'll see more data and thus more machine learning advances in this amplification sort of way. Cool. And then perhaps one last one for, for Michaela. This one is from Nick Vangos. How do you plan on testing your models when they are intrinsically tied to real people and their experiences after clinical treatment? It seems like model validation is exceptionally difficult. So um, definitely, um, this is an important challenge. The fact that different patients may have different responses to different types of treatments and they may internalize actually differently. So some people may not want to have certain side effects, depending maybe even some elderly may not want to be treated if the side effects are of a certain type. All of that plays an important role and is something that's complicated, but it's something that we are looking at together with clinicians. And in terms of methodology, just very recently in the last uh, AAAI, so which is 
one of our main conferences, AI conferences, we have published a paper exactly about this topic of how to deal with um, multi-objective um, preference function of patients and how to possibly infer those from observational data and how to build recommender systems for patients to be able to decide together with their clinicians what would be best for them. So complicated, but we are making progress on it. Cool. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we'll leave it for that for the Q&A. Um, Janine, shall I hand back over to you? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I just want to um, extend a big thanks to you, Shores, and of course to John Gilbert and Mihaela for a really great session today. The talks were fantastic and the discussion was also really awesome. Um, also, a big thank you to our audience for joining us, as always. Um, you can find a recording of today's event and all of our other events on the Life Science Across the Globe.org website and also on Janelia's YouTube channel. Um, they'll be available in the next day or two. Um, I also encourage all of you on the call to please take a moment and complete the brief survey that I linked in the chat box. We love to hear your feedback on the specific events and on the series overall. And we also give you an opportunity to give us some ideas of uh, topics that you would like to see in future life science across the globe events. So just as a reminder, we have two events left this year with the next one taking place on October 6th which is a Thursday instead of a Wednesday. Uh, it'll be hosted by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories and it focuses on brain body physiology. So please join us for that.